Recording has started. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, thank you guys all for, for coming here in this uh, virtual uh, bi-weekly meetings that we've been having. So I'm Karen O'Neill, if you don't know me, I'm the director of Green Bank Observatory. And if anybody is wondering, if you look at this picture of the GBT here, actually the fall colors are just a little bit past this right now. So we're at a peak fall foliage at the moment. So uh, although you can't come into our science center and visit, you can at least come on down if you wanna enjoy the colors. So with that, let me just, uh, try if I can get my there we go kick this off so uh, we're going to have a, a very brief overview by me uh, giving a status update on what's going on at the observatory after I speak Larry Morgan will talk for a few minutes about the uh, Argus 144 workshop that just uh, finished here in Green Bank and then on to the main event which will be uh, Enrico talking about glass cl gas clouds in the Milky Way's nuclear wind so with that just to give you guys an update of where we're at um, this is the, uh, the map of uh, West Virginia, and Green Bank is over on the uh, eastern side there, just above the, the word click. Um, so as you can see, the number of cases within uh, the county is low. We're down to uh, one probable case in the county, which is fantastic. And overall, across <coughs> the state of West Virginia, the number of uh, tests, uh, positive tests is actually going down. So that's, that's good news for uh, West Virginia and for the area. Uh, within the observatory itself, of course, we uh, remain in full operation, at least as a result of the, uh, um, the COVID um, epidemic. Uh, so we are, though, coming off of a shutdown at two weeks ago when we had our last talk. I talked about the fact we were about to go into a shutdown. So this was just uh, some summer maintenance work that is carried over. So in this case, replacing a section of the, uh, the grout, essentially the concrete, um, underneath the track, just something we have to do as the telescope ages. Um, we did manage to take advantage of this though. We put the, uh, the LASI instrument up on the telescope and they got a lot of uh, data from that. So we can look forward to some new LASI results coming out over the next few weeks as they analyze that. And we did a few other hardware upgrades to the telescope during that. The GBT is still down. We're letting this, uh, the, the grout actually um, settle and harden. And we'll be restarting the telescope on uh, Friday at 4.30, just as scheduled. So with that, just a quick reminder of the uh, workshops coming up. Of course, uh, next week we have our observer training workshop. That one is completely full, but the next one is scheduled for February 9th and 10th. So I encourage you, if you're interested, to sign up for those. And then we have the single dish training school with Arecibo that is currently scheduled for May. Again, the details of that aren't quite out yet, but they will be out. Um, probably by the, the time of this next uh, bi-weekly call in two weeks. So with that, I'll just remind everybody to use your Q&A or your chat to, answer, to uh, ask any questions that you may have. And I will um, hand this off then to Larry Morgan to talk a little bit about the Argus 144 workshop. Okay, thanks, Karen. <clears throat> just uh, find my screen. Yeah, hopefully you can all see that. So we, uh, yeah, held the three-day meeting, wider and deeper agreement, the new August 144 instrument last week, uh, sorry, the week before, um, at Green Bank, and it was a rousing success, thanks to the SOC who are listed here. Um, I believe this was our first uh, meeting that had originally been intended to be held in person, that we had to transition to being a virtual meeting, at least on this scale. Um, and despite that, there was a high quality of content. Uh, we ended up having just two hours per day uh, in each session, followed by an hour's discussion. Uh, so each talk was only 15 minutes with four minutes for questions. And there was a high quality of content that people really stuck to that and managed to get all their, their information in. It was really good. 
Uh, we had 96 unique participants over the three days from 15 different countries, um, about a third of those being GVO participants. Uh, but we had a really great level of engagement, uh, particularly in the post-presentation discussions. Uh, we will be making uh, all of the videos for which, all of the talks for which we get permission, we will be making available online. And so anyone who wasn't able to attend will be able to catch up on what was discussed and presented at that meeting. Uh, just to briefly summarize what was said at the meeting. Uh, the first day was largely centered around technical talks and discussions um, in which were presented lots of interesting challenges we have to overcome to build the Argus 144 instrument, um, though I heard multiple times that it's just engineering. So people don't seem to think that's a problem. Uh, it was demonstrated that the GPT is an excellent instrument, um, in excellent telescope for this instrument with the amount of uh, nighttime three millimeter weather we get here that we're hoping to expand through the use of LASI um, coming up. And it was pointed out that we have a unique resolution for the low excitation transitions for um, tracing cold clouds and so on. There's a considerable overlap with armor in terms of scientific uh, aims with the GPT able uh, to multiply the mapping speed of armor by 10 times at that wavelength with Argus 144. Um, we're seeking broader input uh, than we had for Argus 16 for our design group. We also have many opportunities for research and development projects outside of the main proposal, uh, which I'll go come back to in a minute. The second day uh, was largely based around the science that was that is hoped to come out of Argus 144. Um, many of these involve star formation, but not exclusively. Uh, we have the angular momentum problem, which Shei Yu Shen uh, presented upon. Um, and the real strength of Argus 144 will be the statistical significance of the samples we'll be able to produce. Um, it was pointed out that the clean beam of GBT, um, along with the access to the scale height of nearby galaxies, will give us something almost unique amongst uh, facilities in the world. Um, something else that may not be replicated elsewhere is that the increased sensitivity will give us access to uh, tracing material in low surface brightness galaxies, which has previously been undetected. Um, there have been many suggestions about how we actually run the Argus 144 machine, um, with some people suggesting we provide uh, dictated surveys. We decide what those surveys will be ahead of commissioning the instrument. Um, these are things that are still open for discussion. So if you're interested in directing that sort of thing, please get in contact with us. Um, <clears throat> there was a considerable discussion around the software that will need to be implemented for the Argus 144 instrument. Um, around the world, more and more facilities are providing science-ready data products. Um, the Argus 144 will potentially produce almost nine terabytes of data per hour. Um, and so this is something we're clearly going to have to um, think about ahead of schedule. Um, again, there's room for discussion and input from the community in this. We're also looking for any commonality with other, other telescopes. If other telescopes are developing software for large data cubes, um, large survey instruments, um, if there's any way we can uh, collaborate with those, we'd be interested in talking to you. <clears throat> in summary, the meeting really set out well the scientific merit of Argus 144. We already had a good science case in our last proposal, but this really clarified that and um, solidified it. We've also clarified the engineering needs, what we need to accomplish before the next Argus 144 proposal goes in which is planned to be a little over a year from now, um, but there's plenty of work to be done before then. And we want this to be, well, we need this to be a community driven instrument. So we need everyone out there to help make this a reality. Um, and we're gonna accomplish that by forming science and engineering steering committees under the headings of science, which um, should be a straight shot um, as we have a solid science case already, but we have a lot of input coming too. Um, <clears throat> which we may be able to take advantage of August 16 for preliminary work in. Uh, anyone interested in joining this effort, please email me. Um, I'll give my email address in a minute. We have multiple software issues to be addressed as well, um, under which comes the technical specifications, uh, mapping trajectories, and the level of data reduction we want for a pipeline and so on. And of course, we sacrifice uh, flexibility for the um, generality of the software purpose. So the, the more flexible the instrument, the harder the software is going to be to design. Uh, this is something we're going to have to weigh up. 
there are quite a number of engineering issues that we need to clarify, including the LO distribution, the no noise amplifier development. There were some exciting results shown at the meeting, which uh, if you want to catch up on that, there will be a talk by Miko Veronen online at some point, which you should look at. Um, but we also need to finalize instrument design. And as with any project nowadays, the broader impacts aspect is essential and, and yet undefined. So anyone who has any ideas they'd like to explore with that, particularly under university or college collaborations, please again, get in touch. We have grant opportunities coming up very soon, some of them very soon, um, which will allow us to explore some of the ideas I've discussed. And if you are at all interested in helping us turn this into a reality, please contact me. And as I said before, we cannot do this without the community. So if you feel at all interested, please get involved. Thank you. Okay, Jay, would you please make an introduction for Enrico DT? I'm gonna out leave the name pronunciations up to you, Enrico. No, I'll, I'll say something. This is uh, our talk today is by Enrico Di Teodoro, who was a stock at Johns Hopkins. And uh, take it away, Enrico. Right. Uh, okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Great. <clears throat> yeah, so first of all, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity of this talk. Uh, so today I would like to tell you something about the cold gas phase in the nuclear outflow of our galaxy, the Milky Way. And this is a work that, uh, that I'm doing uh, in close collaboration with Jay Lockman uh, at Green Bank. Okay, let's get started. Okay, so uh, our galaxy, as many other galaxies in the universe, uh, has a large-scale nuclear wind. And uh, we know that because uh, uh, a few years ago, we observed these two giant lobes uh, generating from the center of our galaxy. And these are called the, the Fermi bubbles. And uh, they extend up to 10 kpc from the galactic center. And they are observed at different wavelengths uh, from the very high energy in gamma rays uh, all the way down to uh, radio emission. And uh, the usual uh, interpretation for this kind of structure is that we are seeing uh, a large biconical outflow originating from the galactic center. And uh, this can be powered by either uh, the star formation in the, in the central regions of our galaxy, which is quite intense, or uh, alternatively uh, from, uh, by the supermassive black hole activity. Uh, there is still debated what's the main power source for the galactic wind. But today I'd like to focus on the role of cold gas in this wind. And in particular, uh, I would like to, to tell you something about emission lines that can be used to study the, the nuclear wind. Because emission lines like H1 or CO lines are very powerful because uh, they give you the kinematic information, which means that we are able to disentangle material that is in uh, the foreground from material that is at the galactic center. And this kind of exercise was done back in the 80s uh, by Jay Lockman. Uh, and uh, most recently also uh, in H1. So they produced this map that you see here uh, uh, on, the, on, the <coughs> on the left. This is a, a map of the H1 um, distribution at the galactic center. So basically they removed all the uh, foreground emission. Now, as you can see, there is a big hole in the distribution of the H1 in, uh, in the central part of our galaxy. This is about five kpc wide. And what is very interesting is that the, this whole anti-correlate with the gamma ray emission from the Fermi bubble, which means that if you look at this plot over here, when uh, the position where the emission of the gamma ray rise, rays, uh, this is where the H1 emission is, uh, <coughs> is falling down. So these two processes seem to be related to each other somehow, the hole and the gamma ray emission. And however, it's not clear whether uh, the H1 was blown away by the Fermi bubble wind, or maybe it's just the, the wind that is expanding in a pre evaporative cavity, for example, because of bar instabilities. In any case, what we are interested in is try to uh, find the leftover of this H1. And the uh, first, uh, first attempt in this direction was made back in 2013 by Michael Griffiths and collaborators, 
What they did, they used H1 data uh, from the compact array, so uh, an Australian compact array. Uh, they observed the inner five degrees of our galaxy, and they noticed that there is a population of H1 clouds, and the kinematics of this cloud is very strange because it's not uh, compatible with uh, being in, uh, in a rotation with the galaxy, but it's instead compatible with uh, a wind uh, moving uh, in a radial direction with velocities that exceed 200 kilometers per second. So we wanted to expand this, uh, this picture and uh, for doing that we decided to carry out a new survey uh, of uh, the galactic central regions with the Green Bank Telescope, so much more higher sensitivity. So the ATCA data was the inner five degrees and we, we, what we did was expanding up to higher latitude, 10 degrees, and actually now we are also expanding to larger regions. And uh, <clears throat> this is where basically where we think that a biconical wind uh, will expand. So that's why we are interested in those regions. And this is a table that uh, just compares some of the properties of the different uh, H1 surveys of the galactic center. I just want you to notice two things. The first one is that we uh, have a velocity range which is quite wide. We go up to um, plus minus 650 kilometers per second, which means that if there are, if we have uh, very high velocity clouds, we should be able to see them. And the second thing is that uh, the sensitivity is extremely good. It's about 30 times better than the APCA data that we're using the uh, in the 2013 study. So with this new uh, data set that we got with the, with the Green Bank Telescope, uh, we, we started our, um, our project and we wanted to, first of all, to identify uh, gas, anomalous gas from a kinematical point of view. And uh, we expect this gas not to be in the disk, first of all, so we want to uh, remove the uh, emission of the Milky Way, first of all. And without going into the detail, I just wanted to show you couple of examples of what I'm talking about. So these are two velocity slices of the emission of the galactic, uh, in the direction of the galactic center, the H1 emission. And uh, on, the, on the left, you see gas that is moving toward us at a velocity of 130 kilometers per second, while on the right, you have gas moving away from us at 200 kilometers per second. Now, most of the emission that you see in those two uh, velocity slices it's from the disk. So basically everything is inside those contours. This is just normal rotating gas. So this is not what we are interested in. But if you look closer, you can notice that there is a bunch of other cloudlets floating around that are not in galactic rotation. And this is the kind of feature that we were looking for. So what we did, we just uh, uh, search for uh, these clouds in our new data. And we found quite a few of them uh, because to date uh, we identified about 200 uh, and more clouds. The number is growing because the survey is still ongoing. So uh, on, the, on, the, on the left here, you can see an H1 column density map, not updated map actually, of the H1 uh, population so far. And uh, on, the, on the right, you see the uh, velocity. Uh, along the line of sight that these clouds have. And uh, if you look at the velocity map, it, this is very striking because you see that there is basically no, uh, no uh, easy pattern in those velocities, okay? We, this means that there is basically no rotation in, uh, in these clouds because if those clouds were rotating with the galaxy, uh, we would just see a bunch of um, red clouds at positive longitudes and a bunch of blue clouds at negative longitudes. This is not the case. It just seems like a random velocity field. So these clouds doesn't care about rotation. They are something different from this. And what we think they are is uh, this is gas that is uh, being is moving within the hot wind generated by the galactic center. And if this is true, this is extremely cool because each one of these clouds can be seen as a test particle. Uh, within the wind that can be used to study the properties of the wind in different positions. So the first thing that we can do from a scientific point of view is try to understand what are the uh, properties of uh, these uh, 
cloud sample and see if it's different from what we see, for example, in the galactic disk. So in these four panels here, you see the velocity along the line of sight, the uh, full width of maximum, so the line width of our clouds, the radii and the um, masses in H1. <clears throat> so first of all, we can notice that although our data goes all the way up to 650 kilometers per second, we basically, we do not see very high velocity clouds, let's say with velocities more than 350 kilometers per second. Actually, this is not completely true because uh, just recently we have found a new cloud uh, with velocity of 430 kilometers per second, which is one of the fastest velocity clouds that have, have never been seen in the, in the Milky Way. But in general, there is no big population of very high velocity clouds, which means that we are hitting the, the, the end of the distribution. The second thing that we can notice from the uh, line width is that uh, from, a, from a turbulence point of view, uh, those clouds don't look very different from what we see in the disk because they have sigma, a typical sigma of uh, 8 to 10, which is what you see also for normal H1. And uh, while if you look at the radii and the masses, you can see that there is a wide range of radii. We have very compact clouds and bigger structures, and uh, there is also a wide range in mass, and uh, with the, with the average mass of about a thousand solar masses. What is also interesting is that we do not see any strong change of these properties with uh, uh, with the distance from the galactic center which is kind of strange because if this gas is moving within the hot wind and it's interacting with the hot wind, we would expect, for example, the level of turbulence to change and to be over, I mean, always more, uh, more turbulent as you move fast and, uh, and you move farther away from the graphic center, but this is not the case. So this is also interesting. Other than that, what we can also do is to use positions and the velocities, observed positions and velocities, and try to make a model of the wind. And so what we try to do is just a very simple kinematic model uh, without going into the details, but just here is the galactic center and we are in the sun and we observe a cloud here. And this cloud is moving with some radial velocity, which is the velocity of the wind. And this kind of system can be easily uh, written in terms of the observed line of sight velocity, it's just simple trigonometry. So you basically, when you have the position and the velocity along the line of sight of the model, you can compare it directly with uh, the data. And our simplest model is just defined by two uh, parameters, the wind velocity, uh, which in a first paper we consider to be constant, and the second parameter is the opening angle, which tells you what's the um, largest uh, polar angle that a cloud can have to be considered within the wind. In a second paper, then we also uh, took into account an acceleration term because we noticed that our, da our data strongly suggested uh, uh, acceleration, something that we didn't notice uh, at first sight. Well, so what we did basically in very simply is simulating winds with different velocities and opening angles. And uh, a typical wind is here uh, on, the, on the left. So you have a bunch of uh, particles, each one has a velocity and you observe them from uh, the, the sun. And uh, comparing those kind of models with uh, our data, we found that the best fit model is a wind that accelerates from the galactic center and reaches a velocity of about 350 kilometers per second at a distance of 2.5 kpc. And this wind also has an opening angle larger than 140 degrees. And once we have these kind of models, we can start to also to, to, to infer some uh, properties of global properties of the wind. For example, we know we can calculate the total H1 mass in those clouds, which is about a million solar masses. And because we have the model, we know that this uh, clouds must have lifetimes of at least a few um, million years, which implies uh, an outflow rate in H1 of about 0.1 solar masses per year, which very interestingly is very close to uh, the star formation rate in the central regions of our galaxy. And you can also calculate something about the energetics of the wind, which we found to be uh, larger than a few 10 to the 39 Earth per second. And this kind of energetics can be supplied by uh, either 
supernova feedback in the central regions, but uh, also, of course, by the uh, AGN activity from the black hole. So our, conclu our conclusion is that, yes, those clouds uh, probably represent the cool gas component of the nuclear wind of the Milky Way, but we cannot still disentangle what's the main driver of uh, this wind. We didn't stop here. Uh, we also went a bit further away and we, we decided we wanted to investigate whether there is even denser and uh, colder gas in these uh, H1 clouds. So we followed up uh, two clouds with the pilot observations uh, in CO221. We used APEX for these. And we, quite surprisingly, we found that those clouds have a lot of molecular gas. So in these plots over here, in blue you see the H1 emission, uh, H1 emission of these two clouds, and uh, in, uh, in orange uh, map you see the CO emission. As you can see, uh, in each one of these clouds there are many uh, cloudlets of dense molecular gas within the uh, larger H1 cloud, and what is also interesting is that the morphokinematics of these clouds is it, very different. So uh, if you look at the velocity field of the first cloud, for example, this one, you see that the velocity field is kind of regular and also the morphology, you see five very well-defined clumps and uh, also the, uh, the line width are very narrow. Uh, on the contrary, in the second cloud, the velocity field is kind of a mess and also the morphology is not clear and uh, the, the, the velocity widths are very uh, broad. And our interpretation uh, of these two signature is that uh, we are witnessing two different stages of the interaction between cold gas and the hot medium. Because this cloud, the first cloud, is much closer to the galactic center, so it doesn't have, it didn't have time to be destroyed yet, probably by the interaction with the hot wind, while the second cloud is much farther away, so uh, destruction process could be like uh, in a later stage. Of course, we need more data to have a confirmation of uh, of this. But another thing that also we discovered is that there is a lot of molecular gas. Uh, there is probably as much, if not more, molecular gas than neutral gas in those, in those clouds, which is kind of puzzling because uh, it's not easy to accelerate a very dense and cold gas like molecular gas to these velocities. And this is difficult, especially for a, a galaxy like the Milky Way, where the star formation is not very high and neither the uh, black hole is extremely active. So this is still uh, uh, an open question how this happens and we are still investigating those process with new data coming through. So just to come into my conclusion, so uh, I hope I convince you that uh, uh, H1 and molecular gas can be used to study uh, the, the, the nuclear wind of the Milky Way and there is cold gas there and we have observed uh, more than 200 cl H1 clouds and uh, to date, just two CO clouds, but we have uh, observational program to observe more. Hopefully, we will have more uh, statistics on that. And those kind of observations are very useful, first of all, because uh, they allow us to probe the global properties of the wind, for example, the velocity and the energetics in a very direct way. And also, uh, other than that, we can study the physical condition of cold gas and of multiphase gas in general in galactic winds with a level of details that it's completely uh, unreachable in external galaxies. So this is pretty cool. And that's all I've got for now. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions you have. We do have some questions that are coming in through the Q&A. And if we can address uh, one item first as well, I think that this first question may have been for you, Larry. Uh, if there was an open data archive from the 144 conference, and could you provide the HTTP? You may just wish to respond to that one by posting information either in the answer or live. Uh, I'm not sure what the question pertains to. Alexander, can you um, elaborate? <clears throat> okay, <clears throat> I'm interested uh, in molecular land. Uh, in some example, oh, what rep represents your data? 
some examples. For training uh, or exercise. <clears throat> Sorry, could you repeat that? We were having some difficulty hearing you, Alexander. Maybe you can type the question again into the Q&A in the interest of time. Thank yeah, you. I will I will answer your question. Well, I will try not to answer your question online. OK. Uh, we have a question for, uh, from uh, for you, Enrico. How are the distances to the clouds known? Oh, uh, well, they are not known directly. Let's say you cannot really measure the distance of these clouds. What we can say is that, first of all, this is a phenomenon that we see just in the, in the direction of the galactic center. And there are many, many, like, uh, many hints that this is happening at the galactic center. So you have a first uh, estimate of the distance. And uh, other than that, our kinematic model also returns a distance for each cloud. So it's, it's a model dependent distance. But in any case, even if you assume like uh, 8.2 uh, kiloparsec for all clouds and you calculate masses, it doesn't change much with respect to the uh, kinematic uh, model uh, distances. Yeah. Here's another question for you, Enrico, regarding similarity between molecular gas loading factors around one in the Milky Way and nearby starburst galaxies, what seems to be the best bet explanation at this time? Is it episodic star formation in CMZ, direct formation of cool neutral gas by mixing between slow moving cloud, cool clouds and fast moving hot wind or cosmic ray pressure? Yeah, that, that's a very good question actually. And um, Talking with the, with the simulators and the theoretical people, uh, it seems difficult for like those clouds to start like in this molecular form from the disk and to be like accelerated to those velocities without going um, like towards destruction. So this is a big problem that has been, people have been trying to address since like, you know, 10 years or so. I personally like a lot the scenario where uh, those uh, seeds of neutral gas mix and then cooled, mix with the hotter uh, gas and then uh, uh, basically condense and uh, recreate molecular gas at high velocity, which is a very nice, I think a very nice and physical uh, way of forming molecular, huge amount of like cold gas in those winds. Uh, cosmic ray pressure, uh, I'm not sure yet. I'm pretty sure that there are people working on uh, like cosmic ray driven. Uh, galactic winds, but uh, yeah, I don't know if this can explain this amount of molecular gas, honestly. And another question for you, Enrico, are you thinking that the CO detections are rarer than the H1 clouds or about the same frequency and is it detected? Uh, we don't know yet because we just have a sample of two, but we, we just targeted two clouds, of course, so we have a 100% uh, detection rate so far, which is, I mean, it's great, but the statistics is not <laughs> very significant. Uh, but we have a new uh, program on Apex to observe like a sample of 20, uh, of 20 H1 clouds, so we will see uh, how, how exactly uh, how much molecular gas can be detected and yeah, what's the frequency. Yeah. And the CO120, we don't have detection yet. Uh, we have a proposal submitted actually uh, with GBT to try to look at CO120 in those clouds, yeah. Okay. So the clarification, Larry, was not specifically about Argus data, but any old GBT data, which may represent interest. No, I just had to type a response. Um, the archive is an ongoing project. The data technically exists. Um, you would want to contact um, a support scientist at Green Bank uh, for help accessing any uh, particular project's data. Um, and those data, any, I believe the, the policy is any data older than a year is uh, publicly available. If someone may correct me on that, um, but it's we have no great interface for it right now. We are working on that. But yeah, if you if you wanted to contact me or any other support scientist at Green Bank, we could help you find what you're looking for. Okay. Do we have any other questions for any of our panelists today?
we do have a comment that it might be interesting to look for the 1720 OH masers in such environments, about the same beam size as your H1 GBT da data, so the filling factor may be an issue, but if you have an IF free on Vegas, it may be interesting. That could, could be interesting. Thanks for suggesting that. All right. Leave it open for a moment. Any other questions? Seeing and hearing none, I will thank everyone for attending. Thank you all for joining us. We do this every two weeks. Be sure to look for an invitation in your inboxes. And thank you very much, Enrico and Larry and all the other panelists. Thank you.